What's up, everybody? This is your girl, Raquel, bringing you the Candid Stories of My Soul podcast. And today I have an excellent guest. OK, I've been working on this guest for a minute. I've been following this guest for a couple of years now, and we about to get into it. I got the Baron for you. So stay with me and we're going to be right back. Much love and peace to all watching and or listening to Candid Stories of My Soul podcast with myself as the host, Raquel Shelby. From the moment we take our first breath and every experience that follows builds us up and creates the individuals we are today. In life, we will experience both the good and the bad because in order for balance to exist, both must coexist. There cannot be good without bad, nor can there be chaos without peace. We are souls experiencing humanity. The creator is the author of it all. Rather we believe in a God source or not, he is within us all and is present at all times, embedded in us like our DNA. You will get to audibly witness many journeys of individuals as they are living, breathing, and ever-growing documentaries in the flesh. Many will attest to how the creator was there and many of these accounts will be mind-blowing. Please share with your family and friends and enjoy the message we have for you today. Everything good. <laughs> Don't mind me. I, you know, you know me. When I touch my head, I'm stressing, but I get over it. That's the telltale Listen, sign. Like I was saying before we got on here, I haven't done candid in a little bit, so I'm getting back in the groove. So it's all good. We gonna get through this together, okay? Thank you. Thank you. So, introduce yourself. Tell us what you do. You got two YouTube channels. We gonna get into that, but just introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Baron. I go by the Baron on YouTube. I, like you say, I have two channels. One where I tell uh, true spooky stories, uh, mystical uh, metaphysical stories that happened throughout my lifetime. Being raised by my grandma, who was a, who was a spiritual healer a, within the community of Central Florida, uh, well known. And then my second YouTube channel is I do tarot readings. Uh, I just do a lot. <laughs> Tarot readers, spiritual advisors, spiritual healers. Uh, I give spell work. Uh, anything to help help our community, help us grow spiritually. Okay, okay. So what got you into this work? Uh, surprisingly, honestly, uh, what got me into the whole spirituality thing, it wasn't because of grandmama. I mean, that was just, uh, she's the only woman that showed me love growing up. I was in the gang banging and, and hustling and dope and selling dope and stuff. So what got me really into it is uh when I ran up against all the mystical things that was going on with me throughout my lifetime. And I'm like, I have to start paying attention. And one thing in particular, and we're going to jump straight into the morbid. Uh, one thing in particular, uh, the same thing happened to me that happened to my mom that happened to my dad, which made me say, I need to start diving into this because I was a car carrying Christian 100 percent prior. Well, again, my mom was chasing some dude up the road uh, back in the the, the late 80s. Um, and uh, the Hank jumped out of the bush and tried to kill my mom. It came in the form of a horse. Same thing with my dad. It came in the form of a rabbit pit bull. Same thing with me at the same corner, the same thing, same corner, hitting the big beat of cell dope and late night, don't supposed to go up there. The Hank jumps out at the same spot, chases us. So I told my grandma, my grandma said, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta start diving into your spiritualist because the, the, she said the devil wants you, spirit trying to take you out. So that's when I start. Uh, diving into uh, Solomonic magic, Southern folk magic, and everything. Uh, so that what got me into it, just trying to break generational curses. Now, can you define for me what a, you said a Hank? Yeah, the Hank. Can you define uh, for me what that is? The Hank. Hank. Okay. Can you define for the audience what that is? 
So basically, the haint is uh, okay. I'm gonna go simple with it. The haint is a manifestation of all negative energy in the one spot, and it would take on the personality or the energy of your worst fears mm. or in that thing. But it's not there to hurt you. Is there to scare the hell out of you? That's where the energy comes. And some people say the haints are good spirits that's utilizing negative forces or negative energy. So right right on that patch, uh, let's say on that patch, there was a lot of death, shootings, drug, you know, sexual assaults. So a lot of that dark energy was culminated right there on that sidewalk at that corner well, where the, the sidewalk being. And so if in the Hank comes to kind of save you or kind to nudge you out of out of danger. And that's basically what the Hank is. It's the Hank is a good thing, but a bad thing because it can scare you to death. Right. But it also there to chase you away from danger. Okay. Okay. So it's just a combination of everything bad serving as a good thing. So is this Hank like anybody in the vicinity can get it or is it for specific people that have a mission and it's kind of pushing them into that direction? I wouldn't say anybody can get it. Uh, the Hanks, the Hanks from the South, I don't know about the North, the Hanks from the South, they definitely have a thing where if you got a mission, a purpose, those mm. Hanks will scare you straight. Those Hanks protect you. There was a... Uh, uh, Texas has a lot of them. You, if you listen to the uh, country music, uh, matter of fact, I think it was a uh, uh, Alan Alan Jackson. He has a song called "The Haint," uh, country music song. And when I heard it uh, growing up, I was like, "Grandma," where he picked up this hitchhiker. Uh, there was two hitchhikers on the road, in the way the song go, and he happened to pick up one hitchhiker, so he had to pass picking up the second hitchhiker. So the first hitchhiker he picked up was the Hank, and the Hank drove with him all day long. He had a two-seater. But then he found out the Hank, the hitchhiker that he didn't pick up because he had picked up the Hank was a serial killer. Mm. So oh, the wow. Hank, yeah, that's now that's that's not my story. That's uh Randy Jackson. I think that's the the name of the uh the country music star. Um Alan Jackson. That's his story, but it turned out to be a true story from his childhood. And as he's driving down the road with the Hank, he say as soon as he got to the destination where the Hank wanted to, the Hank went to get out the car, but uh, the Hank disappeared. The man disappeared, and he had rolled seven, 18 miles with a ghost. Ooh. So he, he was inspired, and that's how the Hank. So definitely if you have a purpose, the Hanks are there to make you to keep you out of danger, like a guardian angel, but okay. not. Okay, okay, okay. Look at that. She had to drink that water off that shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you describe how your gifts or abilities operate? Do you see visions? Do you hear voices? Do you? What are the inclinations, the nudges? How does that whole thing work? And what do you uh, call it? Uh... So I call it my own self eyes. That's what I call it. I call it my own self eyes. That's a Southern term uh, that's coined in the South between it's i uh, I'm giving you some Southern uh, folk magic conversation here. So you talk to a, a Southern folk magic person, Appalachian, witch doctor, you say my own self eyes. Uh, I see it. I, I've done it with my own self. That's talking about the inner spiritual within you. Uh, versus the pineal gland or the inner soul, my own self. Uh, they say it's backwards talking, but uh, that's neither here nor there. So the way my spiritual gifts work is, is quite simple. Uh, when I'm doing tarot and reading, because uh, or when I'm doing my visions, I go inside your energy field, yours alone, and I tap into 15 people around you, 15 energy fields of people whose hands you just touch. Then I tap mm. into the 15 of those that you just touched. So now 15 times 15, I'm touching a hundred and some odd people. Now that's the biggest I'm going to go. And if I can't tell you what's going on with you within 150, within a hundred and some odd people like you've touched, then I'm doing something wrong. And it's, and that's the simplest process. I don't went and did a, a, a damn near 4,000 people. And that's a headache, but the way the gifts work, 
I I can taste colors. I can hear I can hear smells. Yeah, I can. I, it it it's the, it it messes up the audio the auditory system. The five senses they don't become one. They just switch. Okay. And then they'll show me a vision. They'll show me several visions that I have to interpret within sixty milliseconds of a second. And it's a split down. It's like so the brain be working so fast. And then I then I have to translate what it means because now you got the spirit saying that's that 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 because I do have my bearing. He's jumping to me, and I have to translate so it don't come out offensive. So it's a lot of work. That's why I be yawning because I'm like that ain't me. That's spirit. <laughs> yeah. I noticed that. So after you're picking up on all of that energy. How do you disperse that energy? I see that you use the Florida water and you do your prayer and all that, but like, how do you disperse that energy afterwards? We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Uh, I'm, hey, you say this is candid, right? This is real talk. Yeah, you gonna you gonna laugh. I mean, it's it, it's pretty rudimentary and it's pretty low level. But in order to get it out, I would go and I would like go in the backyard. I would do some jumping jacks. I'll probably do some push ups. I exercise. But if I'm so tired from it, before I go to bed, I masturbate. I masturbate okay. to get that to get the the energy. And as I masturbate, I say, okay, this build up of pressure. I need it out. Okay. So disclaimer for y'all, y'all got to be mature on this show. Yeah, okay. You yeah, got to be mature gotta... and you can't be offended because a lot of times things might sound odd to you because you're not used to it, but we're just being candid here. So I want to make that clear. Yeah. Okay. I can see that. I see that. When was the first time that you noticed that you were like different? Like, uh, or you were heightened in your abilities. Let me say that. Uh, the first time was in the uh, second grade elementary school, Ivy Lane Elementary School in Orlando, Florida. Okay. Uh, I was in uh, art. They had little art. And so they had us draw a picture of a squirrel, uh, well, color a picture of a squirrel. And back then, if you're a teacher back then, they would give you the picture of the squirrel, uh, the picture the big picture and then in a little side box they give you a smaller picture and all that stuff there so what it was i colored the tree colored the squirrel i took the little picture of the squirrel i cut that out i hung it up in his, on the side of his tree as a portrait of the picture and they bring the councils over there and they say why did you do that i say because the squirrel wanted a portrait of himself inside his tree so they were like what the hell going on here so they left me alone. I kid you not. They left me alone, called my mama, said, hey, something wrong with this boy. We need to put him in special ed. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how it was. So when they came down there, so my mama was like, did the squirrel tell you or did you hear voices? They were trying. I said, no, the picture of the squirrel told me what it wanted. And they were like, well, let's put him in the 100 hallway with the weird kids, the slow kids, I ever want to call them. But when I got over there, another teacher, Mr. Valentino, he was like, he was like, so did you do, he said, and this is what blew my mind. This is how I know I have a special I have to give. He said, what about the boom box? Did you draw the boom box the squirrel wanted too? And I looked at him, I said, how you know the squirrel wanted a boom box? He said, because the squirrel told me one of the boom boxes along with his picture. And me and him start laughing. That's when I went home, told grandma, like, come on, this man was in my head. And she like, everybody got the gift. And from then on, I wasn't crazy. So did you continue on in his class? Because it seemed like you needed yeah. to be there because he understood you, even though it, you got there in a very interesting way. I think it's kind of messed up that people characterize people that can see as something's wrong with them but that just goes to show the lack of awareness of people right because i mean they, they label schizophrenics and they, they give these people all type of labels and really they're just spiritually inclined now some of them do That's be it. going off the deep end and shit i mean because yeah, i probably yeah, 
Yeah, it's probably energy overload, and they don't know what yeah. to do, and they just go fucking exactly. crazy. <laughs> I'm not gonna eat my own boo boo now. If I when I start <laughs> eating my own boo boo, you throw away the key. <laughs> <laughs> It ain't got that bad. Now nah, that's <laughs> that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> oh my god! So where did you go from there after that? Uh, after that, from there, I stayed with Mr. Valentino uh, for about two years. Uh, being that uh, we grew up in the project, things went went astray here and there. Uh, my mom moved, so I had to leave that school, go to various schools, and jump around. And uh, and that's when uh, my grandmama took me under her wing. And that's when my grandma was like, you got the gift. And she just started showing me things or making, uh, taking me to her client's house. And I have to hold this. I have to open boxes for them that the old people can't open. I had to take out chickens and bring them in there and cut them at the age of eight or nine years old. Didn't know what I was doing. It's a pure innocence. Mm -hmm. So uh, after, after that, when I used to get out of uh, school, grandma just took me under her wing because she didn't think it was safe for me to be in the community walking around that stuff. Okay, okay. Okay, so Florida, you know, as I listen to True Spook, we're kind of getting into that. Man, there's so many stories. The highway angel or the guy at the the turnpike, that oh, was yes, that was a deep yes. story. It's a, it's a bunch of deep. Y'all got to check out this channel, True Spook TV. I share it. Check it out. As you are telling the story, I literally watch it in my head. Yes. Right. Um, to my understanding, I don't know if everybody does that. I guess only certain people see stuff in their mind as they're you know whatever. But you guys got like this magical hood vigilante thing going on it, that's what i call it right like magical hood and grandma is the shit y'all like and no you the shit too you are you do your part on there too i'm I'm not saying that i'm just saying that grandma when you're telling the story i feel like i know grandma never seen her i feel like i know her like She's such a good person, but she raw with it. And I love that. I love that. When did that really start? Like, did, did it start like you just started seeing stuff and you just started to go get your grandma? Like, how did this whole hookup come about? <laughs> Listen, I know y'all love grandma, but don't judge grandma. Grandma was a shooter. Listen, if I and so I tell you, I got to tell you, before I tell you how it started, so you'll understand <laughs> My granddaddy was a pimp. My grandma was a stripper. And that's how they met. Now, I don't know if she was one of his hoes, but <laughs> they met in South Florida. Uh, listen, it, it, we, got a, we got a rough family, man. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with it, though. So, it is so grandma was out there. So grandma told it that still granddaddy, he worked for uh, some big time Cubans in South Florida back in the day. So that's how we grew up. Now, the first, and this is going to shake when it is. So the first time I knew grandma was real for it like that, now I've seen grandma curse people out and, and I've seen grandma argue here and there, but it was this lady. She owed grandma like 30 bucks and uh, it was right off the corner of Old Winter Garden Road and John Young Park where she had a little fruit stand right there. So grandma pulls up to her and grandma say, they go that janky bitch. She say, uh, I'm going to use her voice. She say, they go that janky bitch, that stupid helper. And I'm like, yeah. And she say, hold on. I'm finna pull over. So grandma get out the car. I get out the car with grandmama. I ain't no grandma packing a 32 under her armpit. So this is how I knew grandma was the one to go to in the hood if I had problem. Not uncle, not daddy. So grandma say, uh, bitch, you got my money. And she like, I got you. Man, fuck that shit. That's just 30 little dollars. I ain't made none yet. Grandma pulled out her 32 and shot the woman on the street. Wow. And say, keep it, you janky bitch. And told me to grab some mangoes. She said, get some of them mangoes and apples. And I'm sitting up there with my shirt flipped up, little fat ass boy, put mangoes and apples. The lady fell walking to the car like it. I just saw grandma shoot this lady, man. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's when I said, though, the, 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 what in Jesus Christ? Listen, I felt safe. That was the start of me and grandma misadventures around by 12, 13 years old. Wow. 
So you were about 12 or 13. That's that's deep. That's deep. So when did the the first mission start? Oh boy, it's so many. Uh oh, when the first one. I yeah, y'all gotta I gotta go back. Give me some time. <laughs> it's okay. Take All your right. time. Uh, the first thing that grand me and grandma had to go tackle, the very first thing, it was with uh, a, a well-known medical professional. Uh, I ain't gonna say their names because they they I think one of them still alive. They but they were twin brothers here okay. in Central Florida. They was known for messing women up when they delivered babies. Because back in the day, you didn't go to the hospital to deliver a baby. Twenty seven some years ago, you would go to the doctor's office. You could get it at the hospital or inside the doctor's office or they would call your personal doctor to the hospital to deliver your baby versus anybody on staff. That's 20 some years ago here, like 30 years ago here in Florida. Wow. So the two brothers, they was twins, both of them was doctor, but they was sexually assaulting these girls and, and like messing them up, giving them scar tissue because all along wanted to stick their hand in these women. So my sister happened, my oldest sister happened to be one of these people they messed up. So I'm a jitty boy. I'm 12, I'm 11, 12, 13. I'm a jit. So my sister, like, when she healed, scar tissue, she can't make no more babies. Grandma was furious. Mm. So the first mission, grandma sent me in there because he was a family doctor also. Grandma sent me in there, say, tell him you got you sick, you needed to check you out. So while he was bent over, like, checking out my knees, hit me with the cestoscope, Grandma walks up in there, and I kid you not, grandma walks up in there, and grandma takes her fingernail, and she scratches him deep. He said, you hurt my granddaughter. So he thought, oh, this old lady tripping. But she went in there to get his DNA. So after she got home, she made me dig under her nails, clean out the DNA. She had me wipe it on her gauze, and she had me get the Florida water. She had me get the uh, graveyard dirt. She had me do all that shit. I'm I'm the one mixing up. This is our first time, my very first spell I did with grandma. Mm. After it was all said and done, grandma lit it on fire. She went back in there. That guy couldn't operate for two years. He burnt his hand at home. He my was a goodness. doctor, medical doctor. He couldn't practice for two years because his hands got burnt up. That was the first Mission me and grandma went on. And since then I knew grandma was there to help. Wow. That is so wild. Y'all gotta check out this true <laughs> spook TV. I'm telling y'all, y'all gotta check out. It's it's really good. Like I've been listening to it since he first started it. It's really, really good. I've never heard nothing like it. We've serious? I no, Thanks. I've never heard. I mean, you got what? What is that? What is that hood shit? Uh, Tales from the hood. You got stuff no. like that. You know what I mean? But no, nah, I, I think your stories are way better because we know they're real for one, and you two are real people and you're relatable. So oh, okay. that's what really makes it really good. Yeah, I just I love how grandma be cussing people out and be pulling out that pistol, yeah. <laughs> and um. I don't know. I love all of it. If you like me, you'll love that. Let's talk about the Baron. When did the whole Baron come about? How did you uh, adopt that persona? So this is going to be a little controversy. And I hope you, I hope you, uh, like you say, you have a mature crowd and they can understand what I'm saying. So 13, 14 years old, I got in a car accident. I was run over by uh, a lady and, uh, I, I don't know how I got wedged under the car, but I was wedged under the car to where the tire was sitting on my on my chest and my chin. My chin was pinned against the tire. So this is a 2000 pound vehicle sitting on top of me and I wasn't crushed because there was some man smelling like cigar smoke holding my hand with white gloves on. And he's just there holding my hand and he's singing the raspy ass songs. And I'm looking at the clock because my head was pent. And I'm looking at the clock on the wall of the little Chinese restaurant, Magic Fry, mm -hmm. uh, here in Orlando. And for five hours, nobody came and got the car off of me. I'm listening to the EMTs talk about how they're screwing each other wise. I'm looking, I'm listening to every single thing was going on. And he held my hand. And soon as one of the EMTs finally come to check on me, because they like, oh, let's look at the body of this dead little kid. They were like, oh, he's still breathing. 
And as soon as the ambulance got there, they lift the car up off of me. He let my hand go and they pulled me from under the car. Scratch it off. I didn't even make the paper. Uh, tie your marks on me, dirt on my chin, and uh, I pass out. And after I pass out, I went through therapy like it was a ghost holding my hand. It was a man. Nobody seen the man. So when I turned about 16, 17, you know, that's when that's when I started meeting these older men in black suits. I'm walking home from my little, little job working at mobile gas station and all of that stuff there. And the guys would always wave and you're like, let me know if you need something tight. Let me know if you need something. That's where I got the name tight from. Let me know if you need some tight. Let me know if they cover the Baron guy gave it to me. And this is the same guy you keep seeing him. Okay, same guy keeps saying I'm holding my hand. And then and and from that on, I start seeing the same guy in my dreams. And then I'm like, oh, he say, I'll make sure I protect you. And I like, okay, then you're gonna protect me. I'm talking to him in a dream like I'm talking to me and you. And then I knowing grandma, I'm like, I don't make deals with spirits or demons or devils. And he say, I'm not looking to make a deal. He said, I'm looking to make an agreement. And he explained the difference between deals and agreement. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you do good things in my name, help me get back to heaven with the grace of God. I'll make sure you stay protected and I give you gifts beyond your wildest imagination. So we shook hands on an agreement. He say, I'm your partner. I'm not your master. You're not my master. You're my partner. And that's how the Baron came about. And he say, from here on out, you're the Baron. And then he say, but I call you Tyke. Okay. So how does that intertwine in the readings? You're still really using your own abilities or is it a merge thing? Like, how does that work? Uh, it's not a merge. It's all me. It's my okay. ability he gives me. But what it is, the way he, the way I, he assists me during my readings, he stands between me and the rest of the spiritual world. Okay. So when I'm looking at 10,000 ancestors trying to talk, he'll drown out their voices and only allow one or two to talk. He'll allow one or two to come up to me and then he'll tell them, get back. So he's like a bodyguard allowing me to hear and to hone in on one. And if the client is talking about, oh, I don't know this, and I say, spirit, go a little deeper. He'll select from the crowd. You come and talk to him. You tell him what he need to know to help this client. And that's how it works. So he's just the barrier. That's why in my prayers, I say, oh, Papa Legba, Baron, ancestors, and guides allow me to be the messenger. I'm talking to all of them to which I'm giving access for him to communicate. The ones that's too powerful, like the ancient deities I've spoken to. He, he does the translation, but just regular earthbound spirits, he allowed me to hear them. Hmm. That's it's some, deep. That's some deep shit. <laughs> hmm. Okay. So Papa Legba and uh, Baron Samdi are part of the Lua? No, uh, only one is the Lua. Uh, Baron Samdi is the Lua. Okay. And, uh, Papa Legba is in Arisha. Okay. Do you practice any of that, those beliefs? Uh, I don't practice them, but with Southern folk magic, the way my grandmama uh, came up, my grandmother uh, being, uh, I ain't going to say Native American, but being Indian on the island of Barbados, coming from where the Congo you know, we brought that Benin, Congo, that Orisha energy. That's why her name is Aganju after Shango's father. So it was instilled in us. And my great, great, great was a priestess of Yoruba, all that stuff. But when we got over here to the States, we had to hide our Caribbean heritage because here in the South, you had any kind of accent. You was a Jamaican and uh, they call us. You was one of them across the waters. So we was taught proper English. We had to hide it. We was American blacks. So, uh, <laughs> damn, that was that was that was kind of painful. R repeat that question. I just had to think about all the stuff that we had to not do and say couldn't eat certain food. Oh my god, uh, I'm so what sorry. What was the question? No, I was just saying, like, did you practice any of that? Okay, but um, I see it's kind of like intertwining. No. And go ahead. No, I, I answered. 
Uh, so with Southern folk magic, uh, when I uh, from Moultrie, from Moultrie, Georgia, when it came down to it, uh, Southern folk magic, they didn't teach me the Yoruba tradition. They didn't teach me voodoo. They didn't teach me none. We believe that we control all spirits. We dominate them. Uh, Southern folk magic, we dominate them. They're, they are here for our energy, our substance, our recognition. So we could dominate them or we can utilize them the way we need to. So we don't deal with one particular, we deal with them all. Because as many people on the planet, as many ideas on the planet, many religions on the planet, tell me about it, we can go in there and talk to them the way my grandma said. So you can't hold me to one principle idea and that's how it works so uh southern folk magic the way i i the way i explain it and teach it like my grandma no spirit got no spirit can hide from me no spirit can hide from us no spirit could be able to hide from you once you tap into that gift mm. Mm. who 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 is you uh who am i per se no 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 you said once no spirit can tap into you I mean, you were saying you once you tap into that gift. Who is you? You talking about the audience? I'm talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Don't get scared. Look at that. See that? <laughs> you can tap into it too. It what, is what what it you, is. you say you. What you mean you? Who? <laughs> surprisingly, surprisingly, what you don't get, what you don't got around you that you should put around you. I'm just doing a little reading right here for the audience for you. Uh the way you can tap into any spirit, you need to learn. You need you need to learn flowers. You need to learn the different type of uh, flora. If you can learn which plant goes with which spiritual energy, you can hold that plant in your hand and tap into the universal energy of that. And you can probably run everything down just by holding a daisy in your hand, holding a weed mm -hmm. that you don't pull it out the garden and link that to every single person that that weed needs to get to. That type of energy, I can already see that on you. You got a uh, you got a flora style manipulation poison ivy and from batman i ain't gonna spook you out of there no you good you're not gonna scare me i'm good so to do all of this i'm assuming because i know you do your ancestor um your monday ancestor prayer i know you do your meditations and it seems you're very like serious about that so how far does the practice go? Like how much time do you dedicate? Cause I know that's a problem with me. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I feel like I got this ADHD brain and I just, I don't know. I feel like in the last few years, like my brain is like, and I just cannot be still. Like even when I try to be still, then I'm picking up my phone. It's the weirdest shit. I don't know what the fuck is going on with me, but how, how much time do you spend on your practices and like what you don't have to go into detail. Cause I know sometimes people don't want to everybody know, but like oh, what, know. what practices do you do and how much time do you spend on it? Approximately. Uh, approximately. I spend uh, four times is four days a week, at least four hours a day. People say, how the hell you do that? The people, <laughs> a lot of people that does meditation, they say, be gentle with yourself. And I'm telling them this body don't belong to me. This body belongs to the ether, to the universe. I'm a vessel for my spirit man and my ancestor team. I'm just a vessel to what they chose to reincarnate all their hopes, desires, and fears, and love into. So this flesh ain't even important to me. So when I'm doing it, and when I say four, four hours a day, it's not that I'm sitting on a stone with my foot pointing at the wall and nothing like that. Um... The four hours a day is I I downloaded my voice and I made my own uh, hypnosis. Me talking to myself, telling me I love myself, telling me, uh, reminding me to do this, get my memory up, my spiritual energy up. And I'm just talking to myself with my head buzzing, my ear walking around. I'm not listening to the traditional music or all that stuff there in, in between phone calls. So I'll sit in my closet uh, for about 30 minutes a day. And that's no sound, no music, candles lit. I'll just focus on one of my Orisha altars, uh, focus on Jupiter's altar. I'll just focus on whatever the energy calls. And that's 30 minutes of silence. I leave the phones out of the room, everything. I don't even be thinking about any other spiritual stuff. I be thinking about stuff from my childhood, 
stuff that I want to see happen in the future. And that's it. So after that, I go and I talk to each one of my, I talk to each one of my saints all over my house. I probably give them some water. I probably always give them a good kind word. I definitely speak to my ancestor pot uh, every day. Not a day go by, I don't go in there and speak to grandmama, my mama, and everybody, Uncle Earl, everybody I ever spoke to. And throughout the daytime, I'll come back home and I'll still do that. Now, the way the four hours come into play, I keep them close because I'll, I have, uh, well, it's sitting over there now. I have this rope that I kind of twisted when I was making my ancestor pot. So I keep that. And as I'm, as I'm in court or when I'm studying, I just keep that rope and for four hours, but I only had that rope on me for four hours. Whether I'm exercising, walking, I have to get it out of my hand after four hours because now I'm overdoing it. So that's why I say four hours a day dedicated to my spiritual uh, strengthening. Now, how often, I, I know you said before that you do walk. How often do you take walks? Uh, twice a day uh, in the early morning. <laughs> and I walk for an hour and a half. Just saying mantras, meditating, uh, shaking off all the negativity, all the readings I did from negative people. I drop it on the road as I go. Drop it on the road as I go. I just be walking up the road doing this. People know me in my community. I'll be just shaking it off and just doing like this. So I do that in the morning. Then I'll do that at nighttime. Like uh, it's like around by 11 o'clock, I'll just walk all the way around to take about an hour. So that's about about four or five miles, a nice pace walk. And I do it twice a night, I mean, twice a day. And that's just my meditation as well. So you are you are heavily disciplined when it comes yeah. to this stuff, uh, which yeah. would make sense of why you're, you're able to do these things because you're constantly tapping in. It takes discipline for any and everything I see. How do you... I don't know if you ever talked about this, but how do you feel about shadow work? What is your advice on shadow work? Uh, my advice on shadow work, I think people are putting too much emphasis on, okay, you have to do shadow work, go to the dark night of the soul. You have to revisit all the bad shit you done did and heal from it. Uh, when it comes to shadow work, I think it's I think it's one of those those commercialized ideas of spiritual healing uh shadow work can be superseded in my opinion shadow work can be superseded just by tapping into what your ancestors went through if i think my uncle willie from 500 years ago was had an alcoholic problem i go and i talk to that ancestor and say hey don't allow that to come to me help me fight my alcoholism help me fight domestic violence help me fight sexual deviation and again it's a commercialized statement that leads people astray that stops their true spiritual evolution if i'm focusing so much on how to clean up some shit i ain't never gonna do nothing because shit ain't never gonna be clean but if wow. i go to the person who filtered it up and i say hey clean up your own shit or help me see past it now i can do the work while that part of me is cleaning it up so uh, shadow work, I, I won't sit in the closet and hate myself. No, I'm not going to load this beautiful person here. I'm going to tell my ancestor. That's why I'm so crazy about ancestor uh, praise. I tell my ancestors, you caused this. You fixed this mess. Mm -hmm. And you demand them and they got to do it. In turn, that's your mental health cleaning up. That's making you be a better person. Hmm. Have you ever had an experience where you've seen what you believe to be the collective energy we call God. Yes. Oh, my. Mm. You got time? <laughs> Plenty of it. <laughs> All right. So uh, the very first time I seen God, again, I, I I never see his face, but I know his aura in, it, in his or her aura present. It's presence. We'll say that. So um, I'm running naked through a field of snakes. I have the Afro, the traditional African picture you see growing up from our era where the guys had on the gold bracelets and the gold necklace, the Afro, the loincloth, and, and the spear in his hand. And I'm running at supersonic speeds like the Flash 
over this vast green field. But as I'm running over this vast green field, I'm stepping on snakes. But the snakes are not puffy, real live snakes. They are flat. They are just like they've been there for years and they are flat. And as I'm stepping on them, they stick into my big toe. And I'm but and I'm definitely afraid of snakes. So I'm running through the snakes and I'm and I'm running. So I run so fast and I hold the hand of some female, believe it or not, because we all have a counterpart that we go to the spiritual world with. I will get into that on another episode if you want to. Uh, when you go into the spiritual world, whether you know it or not, you have a male energy beside you. You're a divine masculine because you're a female. I have a, my divine feminine. Mm. We never know each other. I never get to look at her. But me and her are running side by side. And every time we stop, we hold hands. So as, as I'm running and I'm running through this field, I see this big giant snake big as the planet but it was coiled up but it was flat and dead the head was hanging over and right behind him the snake was the throne of god in this big mm. giant vast open field so i get over my fear of that giant serpent walk behind it and i stand butt ass naked just as a spear gold bracelets afro and I'm looking at this shining light on the throne and I hear God's voice and God's voice say, it is time. I was 20 years old. It is time. And it was the scariest, the most soothingest. I broke out in a cold sweat. It was just everything you can imagine comforting a, a nice blanket, out, a nice towel out of the out of the dry you when you're cold and you just got your ass out of cool shower. It was so that reverence. And I looked at him and I bowed my head down to him and I got on one knee and I woke up and I had all these mystical abilities and I was very strong with it. And that's my first time seeing God. That's a dope story. So my question would be to you, it is, is it of your opinion that when it comes to spiritual abilities, is this something that you can rush or does it come in its time? You got people telling you, you meditate. you got people who sell courses on this, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, is it just as simple as doing these things in the courses and then here you are, or is this, it's going to come when it comes? Listen, people who sell courses and and no no disrespect to people who who feel that's the way they have to go and teach people, but I think selling a course, selling somebody a course to get the spiritual evolution is a ripoff. It's an insult because I'm going to tell you just what they told me. You're born with it. You're born with your spiritual gifts. It's your purpose what you need to find out what to do with. But you're born with your spiritual gifts. The day you sign up to come to this planet through your mother, you're born with it. Right. That's why the meditation is important. You don't meditate to get the spiritual gift. You meditate to hone it. So you're born with it and it comes instantly. And let's say you had never tapped into it, never tapped into it. And one day you just become clairvoyant. You can read people. You can see energies. You can think faster than everybody else. That's because it's you. It's already in you. You just tapped into it, and now it's up to you to control it. No more than when somebody that's a sinner on the street after drugging, hoeing, and hooking, they go into the church, they get a life to Jesus Christ, and next thing you know, they're a prophet two days, two Sundays later. It's in you. So, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that you said your mom was really into, like, Christianity? Very. Okay. So what made you not follow that route? Uh, I got abused in the church. Uh, what people coined the phrase church hurt. This is a kind of sad story. Uh, the pastor of the church, Mr. Smith, Reverend, I say Reverend Smith, he's deceased now. The pastor of the church, once my mom got off drugs, he convinced her to sign all of us over to him. So he was getting the government assistance, the food stamps, the welfare checks. And he would pay my mother's bills for us. But so if I got in trouble, they didn't call my mom. They would call him. So he would come to the school as my guardian. So now that gave him, the, he felt he had the right to discipline us. 
So one day they called him out there. I had I was a all I was a straight A student. This is when I got into the fifth fifth sixth grade. Straight A student. Mom, me, and things going ra raggedy at the house. Grandma doing everything she can to show me that I'm somebody. I'm important. And I got a C on my no a D on my report card in math. So it was a Sunday morning. He pulls me up in front of the whole congregation at church. Makes me pull my pants down. Takes off his belt and whips me in front of the whole congregation. And oh, your mom did nothing? Did nothing. None of the people in the church did nothing. As a matter of fact, they praised him. Uh, Spatter Ross, spoil the child. Yeah, let's whoop that demon out of that boy. He know better. See, the problem was, it's not that I didn't, un I didn't, I, I was acting up in school. I didn't understand math. I didn't understand how to put numbers excellent in reading and writing it i just didn't understand math the numbers just did not number for me so you didn't have a good it... math teacher honey that's all that was <laughs> yeah. that's really what it was <laughs> i'm scared of math when i was in college boy i paid people to do that test <laughs> it's listen for real though it takes a skilled teacher to teach it because i had a teacher at, at my high school that was phenomenal and then when i went to the next grade I had this female teacher I was gonna say what she looked like but that was gonna be ridiculous as fuck so I won't say that in case <laughs> no 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 no. I want to hear what she looked like and let me tell you why if you can tell me what she looked like you're gonna help me relive, relive your story no different than true spook that helps you tap into your spiritual gift and you'll see she had a flower somewhere on her you'll see she had a brooch on the majority of the time but go ahead she looked like Rafiki. Jesus Christ, she needed that flower. <laughs> and I told you I didn't want to say. It so, is time. <laughs> right. So I had to take a test. With I didn't like the way she explained uh, math. I love the way Mr. Sharp explained math. And this is complicated because he was a white male and he he was just a great teacher good guy he yeah. even helped me I reached back out to him in, in college and he helped me with my math then and that's how I got a really good grade and so um she had this test I didn't do good but I could retake it so I went over to his class right nice with the with the problems that I did not do well and had and worked with him on it so then when I retook the test I did a good job so then I don't know how she found out but she got mad at me because I went to his class and got help with that. She tried to pin it like I was cheating type yeah. of thing. And in my head, I was just like, I, I don't know how she getting this together, but who gives a fuck? You should be happy that I had the, took the initiative to get it done any means necessary. But I'm, I'm guessing maybe that hurt her ego in some kind yeah. of way, you know, so that's how that went. But, I just said all that to say, because this interview is definitely not in no way about me. Um, it really is about teachers. And I think that math is, is a certain type of person that knows yep. how to break that stuff down. And and just anybody can't teach it. So, yeah, you'll be out in the water without a paddle or or a canoe fucking around with the wrong teacher. So I just wanted to say that so you won't be thinking, yeah, no, you had a fucked up teacher. <laughs> and that pastor was fucked up too and somebody yeah. should have whooped his ass so you mean to tell me grandma didn't roll up to that church and pistol whip his ass grandma didn't go to the church that the, the preacher didn't like grandmama and that's a kind of funny story how that worked and grandma called them out so without saying i may make this a true spook story uh but i'll give you an exclusive right now so grandmother didn't like that pastor because grandma knew the pastor was taking advantage of all his parishioners and members in the church. The pastor also was uh, having sex with the foster kids he adopted that lived in the household. He and the wife. Oh yeah. So he and the first lady were perverts and pedos. What type mm -hmm. of shit? Listen, and these are the people we give our, our loyalty to and faith to and Trust with our children, you know. So that's what got to answer your question. That's what got me out of the church when I seen such a nasty set of stuff going on. The 
minister uh, was messing with the deacons and the deacon had a, a, a wife that was an usher and they sleep around with each other. We're kids. They don't think they know we know what they're doing. And they in the back of the church on Sunday when they're giving out food, screwing in the kitchen, probably to us going back there, eating the, the, the green beans and stuff like that. And while one of them up there praying and leading everybody into prayer devotion, they done snuck in the back to prep the food. And I'm back there at the table, sleep, because they send the kids back there first. I'm seeing them in the shed, in the shed screwing. And you can hear them. You know what they're doing back there. You ain't foolish. And it was so much debauchery going on in the church. I I, I don't need a God like that. I don't need right. spiritual influencers like this. So I got out of the church, and I started dealing with grandma. Grandmama couldn't go back to the church. Because grandma told the pastor that he was a pedo, the wife was a pedo, and grandma called them out. So they was like, you can never come back here. Baby. So grandma couldn't step foot in the church. But other than that. So did your mom ever leave the church? Never. Mm. She stayed faithful and loyal until he pet until that, that pastor had a stroke and couldn't uh, preach no more. So have you ever gotten a revelation as to why your mom may have taken that route or is that not something that spirit has spoken to you about? Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and right before my mom passed away, we had a nice little talk. I, uh, I'm i not going to get into that one because that, that still made me cry because I still feel like I could have saved her uh, if I was fast enough or strong enough. But uh, neither here nor there. Uh, we talked and I asked her why she let Reverend uh, Smith treat us like this and, and manipulate her. So, and she said nobody else loved her enough to help her off the street, but he and his wife. And she say that she, he would place her with various men in the church and he and the wife would watch her have sex with various men in the church. And she would get blessed on the forehead and things of that nature. Listen, this if I tell you my childhood was great, I'll be lying to you. This is what I grew up in. I I got a real fucked up childhood, sweetie. See, here's the thing. I think when you put yourself in a place of, I, I think it's okay to share and teach people things, but I think sometimes when you start to put that title on it, it's like yeah. the spirit of corruption just comes in. And of course, these people are already sick any fucking way. But, you know, it just it's like the spirit of corruption. And then this is going to ruffle some people's feathers. I think this show, because I have to say <laughs> this, <them>. like, seriously, <laughs> any individual. OK, one or two things to me can be problematic. If you're pastoring a church and you haven't went to theologian school, I think that's how mm -hmm. something to that effect. OK, y'all don't talk seminary. Shit about me. seminary school. If you haven't went there, that could be problematic. But if you went to seminary school and you're still preaching, that's problematic. Because if you went to seminary school, then you would realize that you shouldn't be preaching any fucking way. So why, why are y'all doing this? Like, it's not necessary. And I really feel like people that are ministers really just want a platform to say that I'm important and listen to me. I think it's all ego driven because we are connected to creator we don't need yeah. a middleman and we can yeah. read if that be the case can't you fucking read and if you can't yeah. learn to read i don't know but even with that whole bible like why would they think that an infinite intelligence would write a book why would they why would he need to do that i mean and then why would you have free will but then you've got a checklist of shit that you cannot do that he's going to punish you for like I, and, I, and i just i don't know it kind of like ruffles my feathers because i grew up very religious and I see the psychosis that it has our people under and I see yes. how it works with the government and I see how it allows us to be in captivity and bondage and turn a blind eye to a lot of stuff that we wouldn't ordinarily do and now I do want to add that I do believe that religion is a springboard for those that are going to be powerful in the um, spiritual community. I believe it's some kind of level of your training, but I don't think you should never yeah. stay there, you know, and there's yeah. a lot of people stuck. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I know this interview is not about me. I just Listen, wanted to it's about us. This interview <laughs> I just is about wanted us. To say that. I just wanted to say that. 
Not only are you the baron, but you are a father. How many children do you have? Uh, six. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. That's, and I see you're really passionate about your children. So that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, yes. It's always good to see because people try to paint black fathers as like they're deadbeats or something. And it's so not true. It's like men are here with their children. You have your children, you show your children yeah. and it, it's really a good thing. How many times have you been married? I've been married twice. <laughs> I've been married twice. You've been married twice. Twice. Um, in the course of your marriage, were you practicing at all? Any, any either of uh, those marriages? My first marriage, no. My okay. first marriage, Nicola, her her family was Christian. I was going to church, paying money every tithing. I mean, I I had dreadlocks. I even cut my dreadlocks because the pastor said no. Everybody in the church didn't grow long hair. I was a card-carrying Christian. My first marriage, uh, this is in 2007 or 2008. I left the whole spiritual thing with Grandma alone, joined the Christian church. That marriage lasted six months. Why did you guys get, if you don't mind? At, I don't you mind. Know, I'm an I'm open jump. book. Okay, I'm an okay. open book. I have no, I'm transparent. Uh, the reason why she and I didn't work up, it wasn't infidelity. Surprisingly, it wasn't infidelity. It was a simple fact that she could not uh, cleave from her, her grandmother and her family. She uh, was uh, one of six girls and two brothers. Uh, and the family was a well-known family in, in Central Florida. And we went to school together. So when we met, I thought it was, okay, yeah, I know her. I know her family. We both, our family, both goons. We both in the club, dancing, chilling. This would be great. And we had a great relationship. But the issue came when I'm working my ass off, you know, and I'm a traditional guy. If you my lady, I want you to stay home. You're not going to be my servant. I'm going to come home and make sure you got everything you need. Because me being a traditional guy, what my granddaddy taught me and dad and them taught me, my prized possession is my lady. So I don't want my lady to be with a boss, where the boss can uh, try to slip an old cop. I don't want her to be out there stressing over what the chick saying at home, the job. So if you're gonna, if you get a lady, you work your ass to make sure she's okay. That's your prize possession. You make sure she looks good, smell good, feel good. She got everything she wants. The problem is, I'm trying to be a traditional man, and she wanted to be not a traditional woman. She wanted to keep her money. She wanted to hang out with her family, go out to parties and clubs and cookouts every weekend spend no time and she was dragging me to that lifestyle so i'm like listen i'm finna purchase this house what should we buy the house and she said oh buy the house three houses down from my grandma and i said i don't want to live that close to your family because all of them lived in the same community the Carver shores community so me and love i bought the house in the community i'm going to work her family over there every day. I go to work five in the morning, getting off six o'clock at night. I have to eat my dinner in the room while they playing cards and spades in the living room. So, yeah. So then when I stood up against that, it was, oh, you don't want me to love my, you don't want me to love my family. You trying to take me away from my family. No, you can see your family on certain days, but you my wife and, and she started crying and she like, I'm going to my grandma house to go to sleep. No, sweetheart, you married, you stay your ass here. Now I'm being controlling as a man, because if you go into your grandma's house, who say you're really there? So that turned out to be a problem. We got to arguing lately about it. So I'm a man. I don't argue. I'm gone. And that's how we split. It was in to this day. It wasn't no cheating, nothing. But here's the crazy part about that. I don't even know how that girl look anymore. I was married to her. She was my wife. I don't I don't got no photos or nothing of her. I and you don't have everything. any children with her after six no months. No children with her. Right. No children so with her. That would make sense. Yeah, I think in marriage, you got to have some kind of balance. Like your family popping up at my crib, you know, doing this and doing that, eating at my crib, they playing games. That's too much. You guys didn't have like a set time where y'all had date night or nothing like that? Uh, no, none of that stuff. We just, I mean, we, we went out because, I mean, I'm... I always make I always knew how to make money in sales and whatever I did. I'm a salesman by trade before I became the motivational speaker in Central Florida. So money was always coming in. It was 
let's go, let's take this trip to Mexico. Let's take this trip to the Bahamas, to Jamaica. So it was, we was always on the road. So we was the, the rich couple. And then we're like, okay, you can baby, you can babysit the house while we're gone and that type of stuff. So it was no set schedule. I, I, I work hard. So me and my lady can play hard. And uh, one thing that really uh, set me about that first marriage is I didn't know she had let her sister move in. So I'm getting up, I'm walking around my own house, butt ass naked, right? And her sister comes stepping out of the room, her sister butt ass naked. So I'm I hop behind a pot because we had these two tall clay, these two tall clay pots with feathers in them. So I'm like, you know, I'm adjusting my eye, like, damn, am I seeing shit? You know, I'm going to get some water. So her sister come walking out of the kitchen with the den light on, and I'm seeing nothing but butterfly, baby, between the legs. And I'm like, the fuck? that's a real person. So I jump behind the thing, and I'm covering myself up. And her sister said, you act like you never seen a puss before. So now I ain't even getting nothing to drink. I'm terrified. I go in the room. I'm shaking. Hey, I wasn't trying to look at your sister, but she in the living room naked. And know what she said? What? My wife. You act like you never seen a puss before. What type of shit y'all got going? No, ma'am. That's what I want to see. What type of shit? All so right. now I said this can't happen because baby. And the can I touch her up too? What the fuck? What's uh -huh. happening? I was saying, can I, I touch her up too? No, I'm being yeah, stupid. I, I, Don't no, pay no hey, attention. That's what I thought was going on. And I thought that it would happen, but I got I told her I can't do this. I was afraid to even leave my house, like leave the bedroom. Because I ain't want no accidents. I ain't let I ain't wanted to lie on me. So I used to bring my little <laughs> drinks in the room, drinking lukewarm soda and shit. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you cannot live like that. So I understand. Yeah, so that. I broke up with him. So how how long was it before you got married again? Uh, again, I'm a I'm a I'm a ro hopeless romantic Leo Joker. Uh, uh, it was I after after Nicola, I literally uh didn't have sex, talked to anybody, no woman for four years. It took me four years to consider getting back in a relationship. During those four years, I worked on my spiritual evolution. I was meditating six times a day, no sex, eating right, just going to work, coming home, wasn't entertaining nobody. The kids was on a strict diet. I'm on a strict diet. So it took me four years before I met uh, my, my, my current ex-wife. And again, me being a hopeless romantic, I'm an old school cat, traditional man in an untraditional world. So when we met, I knew she was dealing with somebody. And I say, hey, I like you. I like what I see. I'm not into the shacking up thing. I say, I'm going to give you six months to get rid of all your friends. I say, I understand. Nigga coming in, I'm taking over. I'm going to give you six months. To sleep with whoever you got to sleep with is that shit easy way out however you got to do i'm a, I'm a real nigga about this thing i'm a, i'm from a street zone so i said i'll give you six months to get yourself together don't 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 accept this rain until you ready i say when you say you ready i'm gonna have the rain mm. so five six months passed she said she had let go of the boy she had stopped dealing with everybody else she said i'm ready to marry you Go and get the ring. You pick out your ring. She picked out the ring she want. Ring was like ten thousand dollars. Well, no issue. Yeah, a quad with a baguette. Ten grand on a finger, in the middle of the hood, by the way. Proposed to her. Come to find out, that marriage lasted eight months, because she was too busy still dealing with the dude, because the dude treated her like crap. And she said, and I say, so why would you go back to this man? And this is what helped me understand women, like a damaged woman. She said, well, he treated me so bad, I had to let him see I bossed up. Oh, and I say, boy. so That's you bossed up. So here's a, here's a spiritual story to go behind that. Again, when I say I trust my baron, I trust my baron. So... We're living together. I'm living in an apartment right before we moved to Sweetwater, uh, Florida. We live in an apartment off of Silver Star Road. I go to work. I come home from work, and she's not home. Car not there because on our wedding night, again, 
And this is, I'm, I'm going to pop my collar because ain't no man out there like me. So when I met her, she was driving a beater. Car was horrible, making noise. And I'm like, this girl too fine to be in this car. And if I'm dealing with her, I got to elevate. So on our wedding night, uh, uh, December, yeah, on our wedding night, October, uh, yeah, October 31st, Halloween in that area there. On our wedding night, I took her to a car dealership. Right when we signed the paper at the courthouse, all that stuff there, took it to a car dealership, and I say, pick out your car. And she picked out a, I think the car was like two, three, she picked out a 2016 or 2014 to 16 uh, Nissan Altima, the newest car she ever had. I put down the down payment, I say, but being a real nigga, you're going to pay your own car note and your own car insurance. The rest of the bill is mine in the household. Okay. I needed her to, I need the elevator. That's what I do because I ain't finna be having no lady and pull up at the gas station, motherfucker, see her driving a beater. That's a way in. So I'm old school. My parents raised me right. So, so she was dealing with this man like seven years. He never upgraded and never did nothing. She was still living in her mother's basement and her mother's garage, living out of bins and stuff. So that's why I get the whole thing when I do my readings. If I'm going to help you unpack your shit, put it in my closet. And, so after she got everything, we lay in that apartment. I'm laying down on the couch, and some say, go get your wife. Now, I never met Terrence. Uh, I'm saying his name. I never met the guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I never met the guy. And Spirit said, go get up. Get in your car. Go get your wife. Mm. And I'm like, she had a mama house. You know, I, I'm not a jealous man. And so... I was laying down on the couch, I remember, and I felt the hardest punch in my stomach. Boom. I said, ooh, like I had to throw up. So I get up, and I go, and I get in my car. I don't know where this man lived. I never, this man never hit my radar. So I'm driving, and it's like I'm on autopilot. And I drive up Civil Star Road. I make a right-hand turn on uh, uh, Powers. And I'm telling you just where the guy lived. I make a right-hand turn on Powers. And right behind the, the Caribbean shop and the, uh, the little storage unit is a set of apartments. I think it was called Silver Cove or some shit. And I turn up in there and I'm like, Spirit, where do you got me going? I've never been in these apartments. So I'm driving around real slow. And I see my wife's car at this place. Oh, yeah, I get it right. So Spirit... And I kid you not, there was an arrow on the ground pointing to his apartment. Like, this is how spirit working in my eyes. So I'm like, I'm not going to do nothing. I know I'm, I carry that stick with me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a professional now. I'm still wearing shirt and tie. So what I do is I take off my tie and I wrap it around her door. And I tie it around her door and I leave. I go back I to the house. I see you. Yeah. I go back to the house. She, it took her to 10 o'clock at night to call me. We didn't really do nothing. I just had, he just had to see me, how I glued, I, I glued up and all that stuff. It wasn't doing nothing. And, oh, he has a girlfriend. It was a couple. She telling me all this bullshit. But I saw through it. But again, I was still in love with her. So I say, okay, it's still in the six month period thing. So I get it. I get it. So got married. Same thing. This guy was an occurring factor. All the way when we got the house in Sweetwater, so I let that go too. So your boy done been through something. Will you get married again? Hell yeah. I'm a fool for love. <laughs> I'm a fool for let the right one come along, baby. You can have some ice on your hand. I I I can't be in these damn streets. I can't. I was like, I can't be in these streets, dude. I can get married <laughs> in a heartbeat. I got standards now, though. Well, that's good. That's good. You know, I mean, we always learn from our past and to make better decisions. And not saying that you just, I'm not putting you down in any way, but it just, you know, helps you to see things a little bit better because yeah. now you really know what you want and what yeah. you don't want, you know, type of thing. So that's good even though it does come with some headache and or heartache, oh, you know, heartache. heartache more so than headache. Yeah. Too. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Um, 
But I'm glad you made it through it. I'm glad you made it through it. You was using your head for more than a hat rack, as my dad would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know if this is emotional, but when did your grandmother pass? Uh, grandmother, grandmother passed a year and seven days after my mom passed. So my mom passed, my mom passed August 17th and grandmother passed around by my birthday a year mm -hmm. later. So that was a hard birthday for you. Every, every August is hard for me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Can you tell what she passed away from or is that something we can't talk about? Uh, yeah. Hospice killed her. Hospice killed her. And again, it's a spiritual story behind that too. I was at work. Uh, I was at work in sales and I had came home and I was going to sleep. And I say, I need to lay across the bed to go to sleep. I'm tired. And uh, I hear my grandma calling my voice, but her voice wasn't strong. Uh, she was calling me for a spiritual connection. And she was like, I'm not going to say my real name. She was just like calling me, calling me, calling me. And I said, and I tried to sleep and I say, something wrong with grandma. So I get up and I call my grandma's phone. It's just ringing. So then I called my sister phone number who had moved in with my grandma. And she was like, you know, bro, grandma, I've been calling for you for the past hour. And I'm like, I just heard her voice. I say, what's wrong with her? And like hospice here. So I fly over there in the car. The lady, the hospice lady sitting next to grandma reading, doing a crossword puzzle, just smiling. The pump that shit in my grandma. And grandma, with all the energy, she looking at me like, and the look in my grandma's eyes was, baby, get me out of this place. Take me away. I don't want to die. And she just, and the look, I never seen this strong ass woman look so helpless and afraid and weak. And uh, I couldn't, I couldn't do nothing about her because every when I tried to bust in the room to get her, everybody was like, no, she got to go. She been suffering. I'm like, suffering for what? Oh, grandma had throat cancer. I say she was talking on fucking K. You know, I'm arguing. We, I'm trying to fight everybody to get to her. And that was the last image my grandma seen of me trying to fight between her, her grown up ass children and my brother and sister to get to her. Cause I'm trying to take the, the hospice IV out of her goddamn arm. I say, them people killing grandma. I say, she ain't dead. They killing her. And it was such an emotional thing. And they held me down outside. And by the time I, I, I got free, the, the lady had pronounced her dead. And as soon as they announced her dead, I couldn't even go in there and kiss her lips or hug on her. The funeral, they had already called the mortuary and uh, Mitchell's funeral home came and picked her up and was toting her out of there. And my grandma looked so small. From a big statue woman, she looked so small. And, and I just was broken for a long time behind that because I my grandma called me psychically to come and save her. And when I got there, I couldn't defend off my family to get to her to take the IVs out and the look in her eyes, she didn't want to go. So I, I got a thing against hospice. <laughs> who put her in who decided to put her in hospice? Uh I don't know who decided to, but they came to her house. She was she was at her house. Yeah. They they were sitting there in her bedroom doing this right here. So I don't know who told hospice to come and juice my grandma up and I don't know, but they did it, and I, I don't think I heard that. I think that's the reason why I haven't, so if you want to talk about Dark Knight of the Soul, I haven't forgiven my kinfolk, because the one thing I could have did for the woman who saved me, I couldn't save her, because they stopped me from doing it, so Damn. I got issues. Do you think that that was like some roundabout spiritual attack or something or do you think that's just something that happened like was that some I, kind of mission assignment from somebody no i don't think it was a spiritual attack or or any ma malicious energy involved because i didn't see any because i was using my own self eyes to communicate with grandma uh it wasn't that it was the simple fact i think it was just family members waiting on the life insurance policy 
because she got kids and my aunties and uncles, all of them was in the drug game or on drugs. So I think it was like, because she made them the beneficiaries. So it was it was just, okay, when she gone, we can get the life insurance money. So let hospice do the dirty work. That's what I truly feel in my heart. Okay. So listening to True Spook, it's very clear that um, grandma is like a major staple of the community. Yes, she was. How did the community go forward after such a great loss? Like who could fill grandma's shoes after that? I mean, because it was all type of stuff going on. I mean, yeah. like it's stuff from what I'm hearing from you, stuff going on that people wouldn't even know that was going on that they can run into. So that's kind of scary. So how was that filled or how did the community? Uh, the gap was never filled. Hmm. The Ivy Lane projects, we call them the poking bean, the energy has died. When grandma died, nobody could carry that energy on anymore. You have some spiritual people here but none of them are willing to put themselves in harm's way to battle the, to battle a spirit or to correct some stuff that's going wrong spiritually. The the spiritual practitioners now, in my opinion, in Central Florida, they just come to me, I get your money. Come to me, I get your man. Come to me, I get your house. Nobody is really taking the time to go out there and involve themselves in people's problems to help them, like grandma used to do. And so when she passed away, Everybody knew that it was a it was a dawn of a it was a dawn of a dying era. Not to say my grandma was the best person on the planet because she had her flaws, but when it came to making sure you okay, if she like you, she like you. And you didn't want to take that mantle, huh? I couldn't take it, and here's the reason I couldn't take it: I was still a hot boy at the time. At the grandma oh. go. I'm 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 a I'm a working man. I got kids. Uh, you know, I'm in the money clothes and hoes and I Yeah, it is what it is. So I couldn't take it. I wasn't ready. So now I I've taken the mantle now via uh social media and YouTube. And that's why I'm so caring uh when it comes down to doing services for people. Okay. Okay, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Man, we have unpacked so much. And at this point, I think I need to save something for a, a second interview. <laughs> the second interview, a third interview. Yeah, we gotta keep it going because um this this was dope. This was really dope just uh to peer into your life a little bit. And I know there are some other questions that I could ask and got deeper with, but I truly believe that things come in its own timing. So I'm gonna let that come in its time, but I really, truly appreciate this interview. I enjoyed Thank you. it. This is, this is the realest interview I've had in a long time. I mean, I, I I can talk about the situations and circumstances of my life because uh, I'm pretty private, believe it or not. I'm transparent, but I'm private with talking about it. So I thank you for giving me the window to, to share a little bit. It's therapy. Oh, for sure. Oh, oh, for sure. I just, you know, I try to do my part a little bit. And I think it's important to for the community and our people to see people of color do these things, you know, um, yeah. because there's so many, there's so many white people that do it and they're out here channeling and they're doing their thing. And it's very few of us coming forward, doing it a little bit now, but not like they are. I seen the first black channeler this year. Her name is Erin, Erin Lyons. And I actually, mm -hmm found out about her from watching black magic 363's youtube channel so mm -hmm. i think she's interesting so just to see you know people like yourself and aaron it's it's really amazing it really is so i'm gonna try to get everybody i can because um we need to see this we do and i'm hoping that we can come out of this um religious psychosis because i think it's really hurting our community but at the same time i trust creator that's working through all of us and know that it will it will be okay. I wanted to get into some uh futuristic premonitions and deeper conversation, but we're gonna we gonna save that for another interview. Yeah, I got <laughs> I got the so so just on that alone, uh the people on the East Coast, just this is a premonition. I did a premonition on my YouTube channel about something big was supposed to happen in September. They didn't tell me the year, but they told me the date September the 13th. To like the the twentieth that window, uh, I've been following the news and everything. Uh, 
They just had the uh, earth, as, as the day of this, they just had the earthquake in Morocco. They got the war going on in Ukraine and in the African BRICS nation. But where I see where the medical issue was, there's going to be a medical issue. And again, I said the Pennsylvania, the east coast of Florida is going to be hit with something very heavy. And I'm looking at this giant storm that they're cooking up. So if you don't want to get sick, order mosquito repellent, insecticide, pesticide, prep yourself. This is how it's going to attack us. And a lot of people are going to get sick within the next two weeks after this storm passes due to the mosquitoes it's bringing in. And that's going to be, I think that's going to attribute to a lot of bodies being built up on the East Coast due to this storm. So that's that's the one prediction. <laughs> that's well, thank you for that. Um, before we get out of here, what do you think about this whole hookup with Trump? Uh, talking about his uh his indictment and all that stuff. Yeah, do you think do you think ultimately he'll make presidency or uh I do. If I gotta say Trump will make presidency, but he he's gonna make presidency due to uh the current president expiring and uh this and then our current vice president. Uh, giving away the throne. It's going to be a giveaway. Trust me, it's going to be like, I can't take it. I don't want it. I don't need it. That okay. type of stuff. And he's going to take it over. But when he takes it over, it's not going to be cookies and cream. It's going to be a retribution. Mm. And he and trust me, all the Republicans that went against him, he's going to go up against their ass. I did a tarot card reading on my, uh, just on a live about it, which I don't get into politics. And he is going he is going to win, if not this election, the next one. But he will be another, he will have another term in the office. Okay. I did, uh, My I believe it was my husband told me that Michelle Obama is trying to get into the race. I'm like, oh. Uh, she ain't going to win. She she ain't got a chance in hell. Okay. Okay. Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to share some of your links, probably that what we just talked about, you did the reading on. I'm going to share a couple of your readings and a couple of your uh, true spooks. I'm going to put the links in the about <laughs> so people can click because I'm serious. I want them to check you out I don't, and I want to make it as easy as possible for them. So I'm, I'm going to put that stuff in there. Or if you have some that you want me to really share, you can send that to me. But um, I thank you so much for joining me and I can't wait to do our second interview. This was dope. Y'all make sure you like the video, share it with those that you know will receive it. Make sure you follow the Baron. Make sure you subscribe to my channel. And baby, hit this like button because like I got always say, last time I checked, they ain't invoicing us for likes. <laughs> They're free. So if you ain't liking me, then you're a hater. Either you're oh. a hater or you're just a weirdo because why would you watch somebody you don't like? So hit mm. the like button. All right, y'all. Check y'all next time. And we are out. You, let's keep in touch head on over to rockyroadtv.com slash network and when you arrive to the page scroll on down to the prompt to lead you to subscribe to my newsletter enter your email first name last name hit subscribe this first button leads you to rocky road tv and the second one leads you to porch talk sign up to be a guest on candid stories of my soul or the black love group chat with this form here's how to get to rocky road tv youtube channel through the browser and how to get to porch talk youtube channel from the browser. Yes, these are both my YouTube channels. Please subscribe to both of them. Until next time, toodles! Hey friend, you can now join my Patreon for free. The link is provided below.